I'm so excited to be with you today in this role. My parents send you their love from sunny Phoenix, Arizona. We had one day of summer this week. Did anyone enjoy it? If you didn't, did you like the three days of winter right after that? Something for everyone. My parents are in Phoenix, Arizona today in preparation for the Dream Conference. This is a conference uh, put on by Pastor Tommy Barnett, the Barnett family at Dream City Church. My parents have been attending this conference since before I was born. And this year, my dad was asked to speak. He's the closer of the conference this year. So he's there. He's training. I imagine he's lifting weights right now in preparation. No, he doesn't do that. <laughs> that I know of. But you know my dad. You know his admiration and the inspiration that Pastor Tommy Barnett has been on his life. This is like his Super Bowl, okay? So be in prayer for him. Um, he's, he's got it, you know. Um, so that's where they are. And so today, you get me. Yay! <laughs> Oh, man, I'm so excited. I was a little bit nervous, I'll be honest, because last weekend was so incredible. And then my dad was like, all right, we'll see ya. Go get them. <laughs> okay. The Cultural Moment Conference was more than I even expected it to be. I felt like my brain grew three sizes that day, like the Grinch, but for your brain. And then if you remember the week before that, my dad brought the message on counterculture. Were you here for that one? Now, I've heard a lot of Pastor Ron Wood's sermons in my lifetime. Lost count at the age of 10. They've all been great. All of them. Hi, Dad. All of them have been great. <laughs> but that one, the counterculture, that one was one of those you think about for a long time. And it's going to get even more and more relevant. So I've just felt like even the whole month of February, something's been building here. And it seems like maybe there's a stirring going on. Do you feel it? And not even just at our church. I feel like in our nation right now, there seems to be something going on. You sense in it. Has anybody heard of Asbury University? Okay. <laughs> If you have not heard or seen anything on the news, I'll catch you up really quick. Okay, Asbury University is a Methodist school in Wilmore, Kentucky. On February 8th, they had their regularly scheduled chapel service, nothing out of the ordinary, but something happened when the students responded to the message that day. They lingered in the altar in prayer and worship for a few hours. They missed lunch. That's how you know it's real. A few hours turned into 24 hours. Nobody left the auditorium. And then 48. And then 72. And then they canceled class for the week. And nobody moved. As of Wednesday, it's been two solid weeks of continuous revival, which is an amazing thing. And now it's even bigger than just the student body. You can see this is their main auditorium. It's bigger than the student body, so they had to open up other buildings on campus because once people heard, there were crowds traveling in from out of town just to be a part. The other buildings they opened filled up really fast, so now they're just all out on the lawn. There is no more room at Asbury University for people to come. In fact, this town of Wilmore itself is at capacity. There are road signs out on the city limits that say, please watch online. And it has their <laughs> URL. You can just live stream it. Because there's no more room in the whole town for the people who are trying to attend the revival. It's an amazing thing. And as this has garnered attention online, as everything does, out came the cynics. Two weeks ago in the countercultural message, my dad talked about the spirit of cynicism that we're going to have to rise up against. And so soon we had a perfect example. Is it real? They asked. Are you sure this isn't just for 15 minutes of fame? Can you really call it a revival? Now listen, I am all for, and I try to get better every day, 
at double checking something you see on the internet to make sure it's real, all about it. But everything I had seen, and I had seen a lot, it seemed genuine to me. But the more I saw these headlines, these posts about is it real, is it real, it did cause me to pause and ask, are they really experiencing revival? And the Holy Spirit answered me, would you like to know what he said? Okay, I'll tell you. When I said, are they really experiencing revival? The Holy Spirit said, are you? Isn't God good? <laughs> are you? And so it turns out that maybe the only person we need to make sure is having a genuine encounter with God is ourselves. Very good. You see, we make revival out to be this big thing we pray and we seek and even beg God for. And I don't know what we expect, like something's going to blow through the room or fall from the sky and hit everybody all at once. But the Holy Spirit's been dealing with me about this over the last few weeks. And what I've learned is that revival is a choice, a choice that we make. Revival will not just happen to us. We must participate. You see, the students of Asbury don't have a special access to God that you and I don't have. There's not more of his presence available in Kentucky than anywhere else in the world. So maybe we're not supposed to just watch and hope and wait and just hope it passes by us. God is not on tour. He's Emmanuel. It's not Emmanuel, God will be with you in a moment. He's Emmanuel, God with us, here and now. So I went looking in the word for revival, and what I found was not an event, but a pattern. A pattern we can follow to make sure that we're in revival. Not to cross our fingers and hope it hits us, but to enter it willingly at any moment. And it's what I want to talk about today, a recipe for revival. If you'll go with me in your Bibles to Isaiah chapter 6. Who brought your Bible? Woo! Good job, everyone. We're going to Isaiah chapter 6. We're going to start in verse 1. If you'll follow along with me, it will be on the screen if you desire to watch it that way. I'm going to start in verse 1. It says, in the year that King Uzziah died... I saw the Lord seated on a throne, high and exalted, and the train of his robe filled the temple. Above him were seraphs, each with six wings. With two they covered their faces, with two they covered their feet, and with two they were flying, and they were calling to one another. Holy, holy, holy is the Lord Almighty, the whole earth is full of his glory. At the sound of their voices, the doorposts and thresholds shook, and the temple was filled with smoke. Woe to me, I cried. I am ruined, for I am a man of unclean lips, and I live among a people of unclean lips. And my eyes have seen the King, the Lord Almighty. Then one of the seraphs flew to me with a live coal in his hand, which he had taken with tongs from the altar. With it, he touched my mouth and said, see, this has touched your lips. Your guilt is taken away and your sin atoned for. Then I heard the voice of the Lord saying, whom shall I send and who will go for us? And I said, here am I, send me. Would you pray with me? Father, we're standing in your presence today with humble hearts. What a privilege and honor it is to have access to you. We ask that you come and move in power today because if we don't make room for you to do what you want to do, then we have gathered in vain. So Lord, our hearts are open to receive your word. If the whole earth is full of your glory, Lord, open our eyes to see it today. We don't want to leave the same way we came in this room. We're desperate for more of you. We receive it. It's in your name we pray. Everybody shout. 
Amen. A recipe for revival. So in the span of these eight verses we just read, Isaiah has revival. And what we get is a pattern or a recipe that we can follow to make sure that we have it too. Three things happen here that absolutely must take place in order to call it real revival. The three things are repentance, transformation, and commission. Say it with me. Repentance, transformation, and commission. Let's start with number one, the first ingredient in our revival pie. Do you guys like pie? I do. That, I'm hungry. <laughs> I don't know where that came from. Okay, the first ingredient, repentance. The first thing that Isaiah does in his vision is repent. Woe to me, I cried, I am undone, for I'm a man of unclean lips, and I live among people of unclean lips, and my eyes have seen the king. There will be no revival without repentance. And it won't be something that just happens tacked on at the end as we're all leaving. It has to begin with the repentance of sin. But there's one thing that actually comes before repentance that I want to focus on for just a moment. You see, the word repent, it is an action word, but it's more specifically a reaction word. Repent. What are we reacting to? Conviction. Oh, conviction. It's, it's only 11.23. Conviction. See, conviction is repentance's older, ugly brother. Something happened when Isaiah enters the presence of the Lord. We have no indication that before his vision, he saw himself as this man of unclean lips. But something happens when he lays eyes on the king. He's convicted. By who? By the Holy Spirit. What is conviction? Paul in the New Testament calls it a godly sorrow. 2 Corinthians chapter 7, verse 9 says, Yet now I am happy, this is Paul writing, Yet now I am happy, not because you were made sorry, but because your sorrow led you to repentance. For you became sorrowful as God intended, and so were not harmed in any way by us. Godly sorrow brings repentance that leads to salvation and leaves no regret. But worldly sorrow brings death. See what this godly sorrow has produced in you. What earnestness, what eagerness to clear yourselves, what indignation, what alarm, what longing, what concern, what readiness to see justice done. To repent means I agree with God about my sin. To be convicted is to feel the way God feels about my sin. You see, until we hate it like he hates it, until it breaks our hearts the way it breaks the heart of the king, then our repentance is not even really repentance at all. It's an empty apology. See, something has happened in the church over the course of time. We've lost our conviction. And when I say lost, I mean I know exactly where it is. It's like we took Big Brother and we put him in the closet in the back, continued to have church, and now we're wondering where revival went. Why? Because it's in our nature to avoid discomfort at all costs. And we're pros at it. Is this a new thing? No. We've been doing it for generations. And it's interesting to watch how the generations have their own way of doing so. So, let's do an experiment. If you are in the boomer generation, will you raise your hand? Not the boomer sooners, but like the generation, the boomer. Give it up for the boomers. Be proud. Be proud. Okay, if you are above the boomer generation, they call it the silent generation, would you raise your hand? Yes. Yes. Amazing. We love you. Okay, if you're in Gen X, would you raise your hand? Lots of you. 
Okay, so here's the thing. I'm gonna talk about two categories here. Gen X, you might go either way, and that's okay. We see you, we love you, we hear you. The first category I wanna talk about is specifically the boomer generation and up, and then I'll get to you, youngins, <laughs> and me. Um, so the first group I wanna talk about is the boomer generation and up specifically. When it comes to sin and struggle, we had a tendency, a temptation, to just give it the silent treatment. To act like everything was fine, even if that wasn't true. We would put on a brave face to save face, especially in church. How you doing, brother? Oh, blessed and highly favored, brother. Even if everything's falling apart behind the scenes. You know, with good intention. I've got to be strong for my kids. I, I can't let my kids see me struggle. I don't want to burden anyone else with my problems. I can handle it. I'm handling it. It's handled. It's no one else's business anyway. What are we doing? We're avoiding. If we don't have to face it, we don't have to deal with it. And we avoid conviction. Now, did the generations to follow wise up? We absolutely did not. Not even close. Okay, where are my fellow millennials? We are going to rise up. <laughs> From what, I don't know. <laughs> to what, even un more unclear. Okay, and Gen Z? Give it up for Gen Z. Gosh, there's, we're getting old. Okay, and again, Gen X, if you didn't feel like you were in the first group, welcome to the party. What party, you ask? The problem party. Because the younger generations actually have no problem with having problems. Struggling is kind of our thing. In our specialty, our pièce de résistance, which is French for our specialty, is our remarkable ability to skirt any and all responsibility for our own stuff. Give it up for ourselves. Yes, thank you, thank you. We're getting better every day. I'll tell you about my shortcomings all day. I'm really not shy about that. But I'm gonna make sure that you know that none of it is my fault. You see, I'm oppressed, and I'm repressed, and I'm depressed, and I'm suppressed. I'm unimpressed, I'm cold-pressed, and I'm hot-pressed. And don't get me started on my drama. I made my trauma, which conveniently is also not my fault. Thank you. Thank you for under your understanding. <laughs> so we've got two opposite ends of the avoidance spectrum, but we're all doing the exact same thing. We're avoiding conviction. One side says, if I don't acknowledge it, then I don't have to deal with it. The other side says, if I didn't do it, why should I have to deal with it? We avoid conviction. And when we avoid conviction, we avoid the Holy Spirit, the very presence of God. And we don't just do it for ourselves. We've muzzled the Holy Spirit in an attempt to not offend or be offended. We've tried to create a safe space for the lost, a place where we think they would want to come and feel comfortable, but we removed the very thing, the only thing that matters to a lost heart. We were trying to help, but we're hindering. See, because we blew out the bridge between the lost and the God we told them could change anything, but there will never be transformation without true repentance, and there will never be true repentance without conviction. So, could we go get Big Brother and bring him back? Can we start to see conviction as the gift of the Holy Spirit that it is? I think judgment has gotten a bad rap in our society. I'm not supposed to judge you. You're not supposed to judge me. And when we don't want to be judged, what do we say? Only God can judge me. And I feel like God's like, when was the last time you let me judge you? because we're afraid of the discomfort. But God's judgment is not to put you down, it's to bring you out. The judgment of God is the conduit for mercy. So could our prayer be, Holy Spirit, come and do what you do. Move in all of your power, 
convict us so that we can truly repent because there will be no revival without repentance. The second ingredient we're going to need for revival is transformation. I want to go back to verse 6. It says, Then one of the seraphs flew to me with a live coal in his hand, which he had taken with tongs from the altar. With it he touched my mouth and said, See, this has touched your lips. Your guilt is taken away and your sin atoned for. This is the wildest part of the whole vision to me, and I feel like we don't spend enough time here. First of all, if your imagination is anything like mine, rather vivid, when the Bible talks about these seraphim, I'm terrified. <laughs> okay, if we go back, they've got six wings. With two, they cover their face. With two, they cover their feet, so there's got to be some down here. And with two, they're flying. That's intense. And the moment Isaiah repents, here comes one. I imagine that they're large, and we'll call him Big Seraph number one. Here comes Big Seraph number one with a flaming hot coal and bloop, just burns Isaiah right on the face. That's intense. What is he doing when he burns Isaiah? He's purifying him. In the same way that there can be no real repentance without conviction, there will be no real transformation without purification. See, when we're transformed, we gain something, and we'll talk about that in a moment, but first we have to be purified, and when we're purified, we have to lose something. What did Isaiah say was unclean? It was his lips. Good job. What did Big Seraph number one go and burn off? His very nice. I was trying to think of how to convey how intense this moment is, but I've actually never been burned on the lips with a live coal. Have you? Please don't say yes. So I was trying to think, what is, is there anything comparable that maybe a lot of us have been through that will just land this? And then it came to me. Have you ever taken a bite of a Totino's pizza roll before it cools off. Just, have you done it? Yes. Everyone who's groaning is there right now in their mind. What a memory. If you haven't had this experience, allow me to describe it for you. So a pizza roll is a perfect little pillow of delight. It's just like an inch I don't know the dimensions, sorry, Pastor Justin, <laughs> I can't give you those. It's just really small, little perfect pillow, and they come in a bag, they're frozen, so you can put them on a baking sheet and put them in the oven, or the air fryer now, because we're advanced, or you can microwave them, but I don't recommend it, because they don't get crispy. Okay, so they say, like, put eight to 10 on a baking sheet. Don't do that, put all of them on the baking sheet. Just make sure there's a little bit of room so they don't steam. So you put all of the pizza rolls into the oven, you bake them, your house starts to smell like what I imagine all of Italy smells like, and it's beautiful experience, and then your oven goes ding, and you're done, and so you take out your pizza rolls, your perfect little pillows, and they're sitting there, and they're like, eat me, I'm ready, I'm ready right now. And you're like, I'm ready right now. And so you pick up a pizza roll. And you bite into this pillow of delight. And it turns out that on the inside was pizza flavored molten hot lava. <laughs> and now that lava is in your mouth and it's too late and you start to sweat, and your jaw locks, and all of your muscles tense up, and you start to speak in a language you've never spoken in before. <laughs> you know the one? <laughs> because what's happening now is your mouth is trying to escape from your body <laughs> to avoid the burn. It's really intense, so just based on that, I think Isaiah's in a considerable amount of pain. 
with the live coal. It hurts. And what gets me the most, okay, is that Big Seraph number one didn't even ask if he wanted this to happen. He wasn't like, Isaiah, would you like for me to burn your mouth off with this hot coal? He just does it. Why? Why the urgency? The thing about the seraphim is that their whole existence is in the presence of God. They live around his throne. Day and night, night and day, they exist to worship him. They know the presence of the Lord. So when they hear Isaiah repent, I I imagine it was a mad dash to purify him because it is our sin that keeps us out of the presence of God. Maybe Big Seraph number one knows better than anybody that the real pain is being distant from God. Maybe losing your lips is nothing compared to losing your access to the king. So see, this has touched your lips. Your guilt is taken away. Something has to go. We do not get to be transformed and keep our old form at the same time. Thank you. But what do we do? We start speaking in our language. We, we avoid the burn. We'll come to the altar with our sin like heavy bags. <sighs> God, I'm so sorry. I apologize. Please transform me. Amen. And we leave the altar with the same old stuff in the same old form. And then we wonder why we can't break the sin cycle. You want to know why? It's because apologies don't break a sin cycle. Purification breaks a sin cycle. See, we'll touch the altar, but we do not let the altar touch us. Are we willing to lose what keeps us from his presence? Are we willing to let him purify us? See, this has touched your lips. Your guilt is taken away and your sin atoned for. Now, the second part here, this is the transformation part. Isaiah has this vision before Jesus has gone to the cross and risen again from the dead. So his purification and atonement has to happen in a symbolic way. But for us, lucky us, 1 Peter 2.24 says, He himself, talking about Jesus, bore our sins in his body on the cross so that we might die to sin, purification, and live for righteousness. This is the transformation. By his wounds, you have been healed. When we're purified, we have to lose something. We have to let go of the old things and not pick them back up. Then we can be transformed. What is transformation? Very simple. Transformation is the freedom to obey God. That's it. There's no special makeover where we're all going to look a little different. It's the same for everybody. He paid the price so that you can drop your sin and leave it. And when you leave it, you're not in this vast abyss trying to figure out what to do. It's very clear. Now you are transformed and you may live in obedience to God. There will be no revival without transformation. And the final ingredient in our recipe for revival is commission. This is where Isaiah is sent from his vision. Verse 8 says, Then I heard the voice of the Lord saying, Whom shall I send, and who will go for us? And I said, Here am I, send me. I love this part because we finally hear from God. Have you noticed that Isaiah has had this entire experience, and to this point, God himself hasn't done or said anything. It makes me think that maybe our expectation of revival gets us caught up too much in what it's supposed to look like. We ask and we pray, Lord, come and do something you've never done and say something you've never said, and that will change everything. But Isaiah sees the Lord seated on the throne. 
high and exalted. He's seated and settled on his throne as if to say, I've done my part. Now, does the Lord do new things? Yes, because he's good. But if he never did another thing, would we be void of revival? No. Because the revival, the reviving power, the resurrecting power, what needed to happen to have that, that work is finished. And so maybe we change our expectation and instead of, I need an encounter with you, God, where you do something and you say something, maybe we change it to say, I just need to encounter God. Just him. God as he is. God as he always was. And God as he always will be. Do you have to have a great vision of him like Isaiah in order to encounter him? No, you don't. He's right here. Right here. Do you want to see the king? He's right here. That is why we call it Bible engagement. Because when I engage this word, I cannot stay the same. I can't. It's not a will you. You cannot stay the same when you engage this word. It is alive. And it becomes like a mirror and a megaphone all at the same time that the Holy Spirit will use, if you'll let him, to convict us, to purify us, and to transform us. And it is not until Isaiah has repented and transformed that he begins to hear the voice of the Lord. Maybe some stuff has to go. Maybe he's speaking, but we can't hear it because we've got too much stuff. He begins to hear the voice of the Lord. And what's interesting to me is that God is not even talking to Isaiah. God is talking to his heavenly court. It's like Isaiah is overhearing a staff meeting. What's on the docket today, God? He overhears the Lord asking, whom should I send and who will go for us? Well, where are we going? What God is looking for here is someone to send as a prophet to speak through to the kings and leaders and the people of Israel. What you need to know about Isaiah is that he was presumed to be a man of some kind of rank because in his society he was a friend and trusted advisor of leaders, political leaders, kings. He was in those circles already. They trusted him, he advised them, he warned them, he encouraged them, he admonished them, which kind of sounds like a what? A prophet. But Isaiah to that point had just been doing it on his own, in his own knowledge, in his own timing, in his own power. And now he's not doing it at all. Because if you remember verse one of our passage, it says, in the year that King Uzziah died, I saw the Lord. King Uzziah just died because he made a mistake towards the end of his life that took him out. But he reigned for 52 years as king and everybody loved him. He was a good king for their standards. He made great advancements socially and economically for their society. He was just good to them. Everybody loved him and it included Isaiah who would have been in his inner circle. But they're heartbroken because they just had to watch him die. And it was a disappointing ending to what had been a great reign. So they're sad. Not only are they sad, but they're scared. Because they don't know what the future holds now. The options they have don't look great. And it kind of seems like disaster is imminent. So here we have a sad and scared Isaiah in the presence of the Lord. And he hears the voice of the Lord saying, whom should I send? Who will go for us? And I like to imagine that God is asking this question kind of like an adult would when they're playing hide and seek with a toddler. Have you ever played hide and seek with a toddler? Toddlers don't have very much spatial awareness, which makes them really bad at hiding. They're usually just standing right in the middle of the room with their eyes closed. I guess if you can't see them. They can't see you. So their eyes are closed. They're just standing. So what do the adults have to do? We have to just play like we can't see them. Where's Isaiah? 
Has anyone seen Isaiah? All the adults are like, I don't know where I haven't seen him all day. And Isaiah's like, <laughs> until the toddler finally says, Here I am. It's me. And then all the adults are like, Oh, wow, we didn't see you right there. You won. And what are we doing? We're just playing along. So the child feels like they won a game they're not even playing correctly yet. God is not actually wondering who he's going to send. He's not actually confused about who will go for us. You see, when God asks a question, he's not looking for information. He's usually looking for us. He's giving Isaiah a chance here to check himself back into the game. Who do you think gave you that rank in the first place, Isaiah? Who do you think put those gifts in you? Who do you think gives you the favor and the wisdom that wins over the hearts of kings? Who do you think gives you the access to those rooms where decisions are made? Who should I send, Isaiah? And Isaiah answers, here I am. You can send me. You see, revivals always end because it is the revived who answer when God says, who will go for us? Who will go for us? Now, will we all be called to be a prophet to the nations? No. Some of you just let out a sigh of relief. God will call you to do what he needs you to do most. He'll call you to go where he's graced you to go. He'll anoint you to do what you need to do. And maybe you're like Isaiah and life has knocked the wind out of you and it's disappointed you in some way. Maybe you're heartbroken. I want you to hear the voice of the Lord today calling you because he calls the heartbroken. Maybe like Isaiah, you're a little bit concerned about the future. The options aren't looking great and it looks like disaster might be imminent. Don't check yourself out of the game. I want you to hear the voice of the Lord calling you because he calls the scared. I want you to think about the things you've been trying to do in your own power, the things you've been doing your own way, in your own timing, trying to make it work. And now you're at a point where you don't have anything left. I want you to hear the voice of the Lord saying, who will go for us? Who will do it my way? Who will let the Holy Spirit convict again? Who will be transformed and leave the old things for good this time? Who will be who I've created them to be? Who should I send? Who should I send for your marriage? Who should I send for your family? Who else is gonna go for your kids? Who will go for the next generation? Who will go for the lost? Will you stand with me? You see, we've, sometimes we've asked for revival and maybe God's been asking us. We want revival, but will we submit ourselves to the process of being revived? Do we just want the event? Do we just want the feel good part of it? Where everybody's together, we're all hoorahing. Or are we wanting to be revived? Because revival isn't the stuff that makes the news. Revival is the stuff that changes you from the inside out. From the inside out. And maybe we're not waiting on God. Maybe he's waiting on us. How silly, how small of us to think that we want an awakening for the church more than the head of the church. Who are we? God, please move. You move. God, we want revival. Then be revived. 
We make it harder than it has to be. I don't know where you might fall in this process, but our response is gonna be simple. If you say it's, it's been a long time since I let the Holy Spirit really convict me, that's where you start. Maybe you haven't truly repented. Maybe you've said you're sorry over and over and over again. But today it's gonna be the real thing because your heart's gonna break the way it breaks his heart. Maybe you've come to the altar so many times with that thing and you genuinely wanna get rid of it but you can't seem to figure out why you haven't. And you're gonna spend some time today letting the Holy Spirit purify you. Take it off. I feel the Holy Spirit saying, stop picking up what you leave at the altar. Leave it today. Maybe you need to be transformed. Maybe you say, you know, I feel like I've gotten to this point where I repent, but I don't really know what to do now. I'm just kind of chilling. You get to be transformed today. Freedom to leave the old behind and now take a step towards God. There's always something more to do. Maybe today you're gonna be commissioned. For whatever reason that you've checked yourself out, that you have taken yourself out of the running for your calling, it's only going to you. Today I want you to hear the Holy Spirit saying, no, no, it's you. Called you on purpose, not a wrong number. And you're gonna say, even if my heart is broken, here am I, you can send me. Even if I'm scared and I don't know how it's all gonna work out, here am I. You can send me. Somebody has to go for your marriage, for your spouse, for your kids. Why not you? So it's simple. If you will join me at the altar today, we're just gonna seek the Lord. We're not in a rush, but we're also not gonna prescribe how it has to look. We're gonna give the Holy Spirit freedom to do what only he can do. So as the worship team sings, will you just come find a place at the altar, seek the Lord, follow this process, and let's leave here today revived. Come as they sing.